All right. So rotator cuff tears, what's the latest in treatment? So quick introduction of myself. Uh, so went to undergrad at Villanova, then Drexel College of Medicine, uh, did my res orthopedic surgery residency at uh, Long Island Jewish Hospital, part of Posture Northwell uh, in New York on Long Island. Uh, fellowship at New England Baptist Hospital in Sports Medicine, and also did a second fellowship in shoulder elbow surgery at Hospital Special Surgery in New York. And now I'm here in Boston. So what is the rotator cuff? Again, quick uh, recap here. Four muscles, subscapularis, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. Their tendons come together to form a quote unquote cuff of tissue covering around the head of the humerus and the top of the shoulder. So together with the labrum, capsule, ligaments, rotator cuff muscles are important. They're dynamic stabilizers and they help move the shoulder joint. Dynamic meaning providing compressive uh, forces on the humeral head to keep it located in the socket. Obviously static uh, stabilizers are, you know, labrum and intraglenic humeral ligaments. Rotator cuff obviously functions to allow you to rotate and lift your arm. Just to, you know, some nice uh, animations here. So supraspinatus, uh, originates on the supraspinatus fossa, inserts on the greater tuberosity, initiator of shoulder abduction, classically is taught as the first uh, 30 degrees of abduction, uh, lies in the scapular plane, 30 degree angle to the coronal plane, parallel to the scapula. Subscapularis, internal rotation, uh, directly over the ribs is the insertion. Uh, origin, sorry, inserts onto the lesser tuberosity, it's the main internal rotator of the humerus. Uh, the lower 40% uh, of the insertions compose a muscle, uh, the top 60% is really the, the real tendinous portion. So when we're in surgery, uh, that's the one we're really looking at to, to repair uh, if there's any doubt. Uh, that's the one that, that gets the most attention. Um, other things in neutral position, it provides passive restraint. Uh, so, you know, kind of a check rein for stability as well. Uh, that, that's more important in, in shoulder replacement. But. So next, infraspinatus and teres minor. Infraspinatus has actions on the head of the humerus. It's synergistic with the teres minor. Uh, infraspinatus is historically thought of as being the majority of the external rotator. Teres minor is more active in abduction of 90 degrees for external rotation. Classic hornblower sign if the teres minor is out. Teres minor can hypertrophy in the setting of infraspinatus tears, um, but the majority of external rotation comes from your infraspinatus. So classic history, what do you see? It's important to tease out whether there was an antecedent traumatic event. In many cases, massive rotator cuff tears, patient report a long-standing history of shoulder complaints prior to their presentation in the office. Dull and aching pain is more consistent with shoulder pathology. Now, you know, getting into more specific issues, sleep-related issues. Uh, patients with sleep, shoulder disease have sleep-related issues and reduced sleep quality. This was journal shoulder elbow surgery in 2015. 89% of these patients with a rotator cuff tear have objective evidence of sleep quality disturbance. That was American Journal of Sports Medicine in 2015. Dysfunction in activities and sports. So the patients you know, can no longer perform the activities that they would desire to, and that can help identify the true impetus for as to why they're seeking treatment. And it's also valuable setting patient expectations in terms of what can or cannot be attainable via treatment options. Um, so just evidence-wise, kinematic differences identified may have consequences for progression of shoulder damage and further functional impairment in older adults with rotator cuff tears. This was Journal of Biomechanics in 2016. So physical exam, what do you look for? Um, so, you know, kind of classic job test, empty can test, shoulder abducted to, into horizontal the plane of the scapula, internal rotator, so the thumb is pointing down, upward directed eccentric force, test the integrity of the supraspinatus. Infraspinatus teres minor, as kind of we alluded to, external rotation with the arm at the side is determining strength of infraspinatus. In abduction 90 degrees is to evaluate the teres minor in isolation. Subscapularis, multiple tests, belly press, bear hug, lift off. Um, so belly press, you know, hands on the belly, move their elbows forward, positive test when the elbow drops back or they're unable to bring the elbow forward. Bear hug, uh, opposite shoulder, trying to lift off against the, uh, against the examiner. And lift off test is hand away in the back, positive test, the hand is unable to push back or falls to the patient's back. So external lag, you should always look for lag signs, kind of gives you a clue as to how much damage there is. Uh, external lag uh, can be many forms. Um, you're looking at with the arm at the side, the value for tears in infraspinatus mainly. Um, if it falls back in general rotation, the patient is unable to hold it there, then the test is positive for an external rotation lag sign. 
So horn blowers, we kind of alluded to this. Uh, external rotation lag with the arm in 90 degrees of abduction that evaluates for teres in of the teres minor. Uh, patients unable to hold their shoulder in 90 degrees of abduction, neutral rotation. If it falls into a rotation, that's considered a positive test. So imaging, uh, kind of a standard MRI, you can see uh, increased signal over the humeral head. Obviously the greater tuberosity is over here, the ball, socket, superior labrum, uh, kind of joint, joint articular cartilage in here, supraspinatus muscle belly, this kind of is the tendon. So it's torn and retracted about to the level of the center of the head. Again, one of the other key things we look for, we look for is on the, the sagittal cuts here to see, so this would be the tear. Again, sagittal cuts the best way to kind of see the whole view and to see the cuff of tissue. Um, here you can see the whole, you know, kind of extending. So subscapular would be here, kind of interval, and then supraspinatus here, and then infrared tear is in the back. So you can see the, the whole rotator cuff tear here. Tangent sign is very helpful, especially to take a quick view of the MRI, whether it is quote unquote repairable, meaning the supraspinatus muscle belly has enough, uh, or I should say lack of fatty infiltration, meaning that the muscle has not been replaced by fat, which happens for chronic tears. And, and this tangent sign is helpful if you look at the supraspinatus fossa, meaning from here to here, if the muscle is above that line, Theoretically, and it's been shown in a couple of papers here, that that tear is now repairable. Um, so it's just a quick, easy kind of way uh, to see. And then, you know, because positive fatty infiltrate is a, is a positive sign implicated with poor outcome after you try and repair these types of tears. So now moving on uh, into treatment options, starting with non-operative management. Uh, so physical therapy, uh, specific exercises can help restore movement and strengthen the shoulder. Um, exercise program includes stretching to improve flexibility and range of motion. However, the idea of physical therapy is to strengthen around the tear. Uh, you're kind of strengthening your subscap and teres minor to restore the force couple. Um, you know, you, every time you activate your supraspinatus, all you're doing is kind of retracting that tear. Uh, you know, obviously there's physics here, you know, it's not attached. So every time you pull, you're just gonna pull it away and extend that tear. And we'll get into the studies that show the tear progression. Um, but again, the idea of physical therapy, trying to restore that force couple, we have these copers, quote unquote, we call them, where they end up having a supraspinatus tear, but they're still able to raise their arm. Why is that? The reason is because they have, still have the force couple, meaning the, the subscapularis in the front and the in the back are strong enough to still lift the arm. As long as you have that force couple, you, you, can, you can do a lot of good things. So again, we're going for completeness sake here, activity modification, anti-inflammatories. Um, you know, these are things that they, people, patients can try for non-operative management, not necessarily uh, end up working in the end. Steroid injection, this is uh, kind of a, I put this in there for completeness sake. It's not something I offer my patients often. We'll get into that when we, when we talk about the pitfalls. Um, but again, it's an injection of local anesthetic along with cortisone, may be helpful, um, not necessarily uh, long lasting temporary anti-inflammatory medication and may not be effective for all patients. Uh, what I tell my patients is cortisone may help you for three months, the average is three months, but it could be less uh, and cortisone will not heal or quote unquote fix the problem. Uh, it only is there to mask the pain and reduce the inflammation and may help reduce the pain levels so that you can be satisfied in your daily activities, but it is by no means a, a fix all or quote unquote solution. And there are, you know, we'll go through some of the pitfalls, but you know, kind of foreshadowing, there are plenty of examples where a patient gets a cortisone injection when they had a small tear, they come back, you know, maybe four or five, you know, longer lasting ones to come back four years, five years later, and now they have a massive cuff tear, and then we have a, a, a bigger dilemma on our hands. Whereas if we're just taking care of it kind of early on, you know, a small tear, is a kind of a slam dunk, straightforward kind of rotator cuff repair. So here we are, pitfalls of non-operative management. Uh, so kind of taking it step by step, the number one pitfall is tear progression, meaning the size of the rotator cuff tear enlarges. We kind of alluded to that, we'll get to the studies. Um, number two, the initial size affects the long-term repair integrity. And number three, mainly has to do with steroid injections, the increased revision risk 
that, that occurs the longer you wait and whether you have a steroid injection uh, also. So kind of going through step-by-step uh, -step tear progression, these are a couple of papers here. Uh, Kim et al. In, in knee surgery, sports traumatology, arthroscopy, KESTA 2016, 82% of the symptomatic full thickness tears and about a quarter of the symptomatic partial thickness tears increased in size only after a mean two years. So symptomatic full thickness tear, that's why we kind of advocate for our patients saying it's you're, you're better off trying to take care of it now. Obviously you give them a trial period of non-op management, but if they're on the edge, if they're still having pain, discomfort, dysfunction, but you know maybe they're thinking they can quote unquote live with it, this is where we advocate for our patients because we know it will enlarge over time. Um, and then this recently came out, uh, I think it was two months ago, 2020, Journal Short Oval Surgery, uh, determining the rate of full thickness progression in partial thickness tears. Overall rate of progression to a full thickness tear was about quarter of a percent per month. So, you know, it's a kind of a roundabout way of going through the numbers, but it's not, it's not nothing, right? So if you say, you know, 1% every four months times three is 3% every year, that's not nothing. If you see, you know, hundreds of patients with rotator cuff tears in a year, these are real people, real patients that progress to a full thickness tear from a partial thickness, which is kind of taking it to another level from the previous studies, which, you know, only 25% at two years type of thing. Um, so next pitfall, in initial tear size matters. So this was a big study, American Journal of Sports Medicine, 10-year uh, follow-up published in 2019. Rotator cuff tear size at the time of surgery significantly affects the supraspinase, the number one tendon that's torn for quote-unquote rotator cuff tear, that integrity at a follow-up of 10 years. So patients with an intact supraspinatus showed superior results in all functional scores, uh, flexion strength, higher distance, meaning lower grade of osteoarthritis, and the smaller tears of the index procedure has significantly higher functional outcome scores. So this kind of clues you in as to, you know, when we're talking to our patients and we want to give, kind of give them the best information, you know, this kind of leads us towards the direction that's nudging us towards uh, advocating for, for repairing these tears when they are smaller and there are more manageable because here's the objective evidence. You have better functional outcome scores at 10 years. And, bet, and more supraspinatus integrity at 10 years. So next, delayed repair, right? So people will say, can I wait, can I wait, can I wait? Um, you can, obviously, you know, no, no one dies of a shoulder. I say that all the time, you know, no one dies of a shoulder. But in reality, the, this is the objective evidence that we have to suggest that it may not be in your best outcome, in the patient's out, best interest to delay beyond six to 12 months, right? So this first study, JSCS 2015, um, within six months improves the outcome. So significantly functional outcomes with early repair of acute rotator cuff tears compared to delayed repair. So that study was six month of cutoff for acute versus delayed. The next study was 12 months and they found a higher risk of revision. So kind of the sweet spot is within six months because you get better outcomes, but if you're gonna wait more than 12, that's putting at more risk because then if you do do surgery, you're kind of at risk for a, 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 a revision, right? Which is nobody wants here. Um, sorry, just letting someone else in here. So moving on. Um, again, so harm of steroid injections and, you know, I'll go through this. I have most of this stuff up on the website. Uh, in the for our patient section, a good, uh, good place to go for more information. But these two studies, uh, both in 2019 in arthroscopy journal, uh, preoperative shoulder injections are associated with increased risk of revision, uh, rotator cuff repair, and injections, rotator cuff repair, are associated with increased revision rates. So similar ideas, but two major studies in a major sports medicine journal, arthroscopy, uh, patients who received an injection within six months of repair were much more likely to undergo a revision and rotator cuff repair within the next three years. And then the other one was a correlation study, strongly suggests a correlation between preoperative shoulder injections and revision rotator cuff repair. So for these reasons, you know, I, I rarely inject patients with steroids. Um, the rare instances are when patients are asking for it. Even after I give the information, they still want it because they are desperate for relief. Um, but in those situations, I have to be kind of upfront with them. The hospital will not even let us operate within three months of an injection because of the infection risk. So forget all these, you know, revision risks and, 
and kind of harm that it causes to the tendon, uh, it's a higher infection risk. So they won't even let us do it in three months. So one patient actually got upset at me. I didn't say that I didn't said that I didn't say or tell her that, even though I, I probably did. It's just she was so frustrated with her pain that she was desperate to try the injection and it only worked for a month or two and then she's supposed to wait another month or two after that to get surgery, right? You can't, you can't do it within three months. The hospital won't let me. Um, so kind of got to be a little bit wary and more, more kind of deliberate, you know, telling these to the patients because it's not a guarantee it'll give you three months of relief. So it's kind of a, a short, a short win for, for a lot more potential for harm. And, you know, on the website, I have a, a whole blog about the potential harm of steroid injections because there's two recent studies that came out in the hip and knee literature, in fact, that if you have knee arthritis and hip arthritis, the steroid injections that you get can cause joint degeneration. Meaning, you know, you have a knee arthritis and you get a, a steroid injection, these patients are, the arthritis is hastened, meaning it, it, it's, you have a shorter time period towards a total knee versus those patients that did not receive a steroid injection. So that, that's kind of eye-opening as to the harmful effects long-term that these steroid injections have. So now moving into operative versus non-operative management, um, kind of going through the literature here, especially the, the most recent stuff here. Um, so in 2019, American Journal of Sports Medicine, uh, they looked at comparative effectiveness of operative versus non-operative for rotator tears. So patients undergoing operative treatment had significantly better pain and functional scores compared with patients undergoing non-operative treatment for rotator cuff tears. Um, this other study came uh, just recently uh, in the beginning of 2020 in Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, JBJS, comparative time to improvement in non-operative versus operative treatment of rotator cuff tears. So patients undergoing non-operative treatment had better outcomes initially but then this was reversed in the longer term, meaning if you want a clinically significant difference, the best result achieving, the higher percentage of patients achieving that clinically significant difference, right, MCID and substantial clinical benefit, they achieved it in the longer term. So, you know, this was the paper, paper that I got published in JBJS, kind of looking through that exact, you know, model that we're talking about. And I titled it the prudent choice for symptomatic rotator cuff tears in a shared decision-making model. So as long as the patient is on board and you've kind of, they've kind of understood what you're saying, taking them through, it's going to be a little bit more of a longer haul, but if you can be patient and kind of do the rehab and do what you're told for sling wise and do the physical therapy, make sure you get your motion back. You know, the average was 15.5 months. Patients in the surgical treatment group had significantly better outcomes for achieving the clinical benchmarks percentage-wise for these clinical outcome scores, the SPADI, and then it was 23 months for the ASES score. So again, this information is valuable, especially in counseling those patients who are willing to wait longer in exchange for an increased probability of substantial clinical improvement. This is judged by minimal clinically important difference, MCID, and substantial clinical benefit, SCB, as they may be guided towards a surgical procedure. Um, again, as long as they understand it's a shared decision-making model, and this is kind of the, the give and take, but you end up getting more long-term. So uh, kind of moving on uh, into biologics here a little bit. Um, so effect of PRP, uh, platelet-rich plasma is PRP, and platelet-rich fibrin, PRF. Uh, so this was a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials in American General Sports Medicine 2018. Uh, current evidence indicates the use of PRP in rotator cuff repair results in improved healing rates, pain levels, and functional outcomes. Um, I actually had a chance to, to review this article um, as a reviewer. Uh, my biggest critique of this article was that it did, you know, there wasn't enough in the limitations to kind of, you, you have to uh, frame it in a way that patients understand that PRP is highly, highly variable. So if you take my blood, spin it down today versus my blood tomorrow, same time, it could be different platelet levels, could be different uh, TGF beta levels, different growth factor levels. If you take my blood versus my wife's blood, same time, same day, could be different uh, and so on and so forth. And it also depends on which machine you're looking for. So tendons, uh, they kind of need more TGF beta. There are certain formulations that provide more TGF beta. There are other formulations that kind of provide more uh, TNF alpha. Uh, which would be another company's brand. So high variation in PRP. So you got to kind of take that with a grain of salt um, when, when, you, when you read this evidence. Uh, so play, but the other side, platelet-rich fibrin has been shown to have no benefit in improving tendon healing rates or functional outcomes. If you remember, platelet-rich fibrin was kind of the, the next kind of thing up and coming that may, uh, quote unquote, revolutionize rotator cuff repair, um, but, you know, not so much. Uh, 
so this one is kind of uh, near and dear to me. Um, I do a lot of cartilage research as well in the knee. Uh, so this was kind of a, a novel idea that someone had the foresight and, and patient reported outcomes to put together in a, in a clinical study. Uh, they were able to look at the clinical and radiologic outcome of microfracture and arthroscopic repair for full thickness tears. Uh, they looked at single row, double row, but they also looked at single row microfractures. Uh, in similar medium-sized rotator cuff tears, and the single-row microfracture group had significantly improved functional outcomes compared with the single-row, double-row groups in terms of post-operative constant score and visual analog scale scores. So, in, in summary, you know they would do a single-row repair, but then, you know, kind of more than the, the crimson duvet, this would be uh, it's ten holes two millimeters apart, posterior and and kind of uh, closer to the joint line of the single-row repair when you do it in this technique, which they, they proposed in this article, they have a significantly ro lower retail rate uh, and better functional outcomes for, versus single row and double row repairs, which was, I thought was very interesting. Um, so then moving on to kind of patch augmentation, right? So, you know, there's been SCR, uh, superior capsule reconstruction, which is essentially replacing the superior capsule in the setting of a massive rotator cuff tear. Uh, this is along the lines of biologic augmentation. Um, the FDA approval for this implant um, is based on a partial thickness tear. Um, and the FDA approval is based on not doing anything to the partial thickness tear, but however, just laying this biologic uh, kind of scaffold augmentation on top of the partial thickness tear. And this study was in general shoulder elbow in 2018 chronic degenerative tears, high grade partial thickness tears, and one year follow-up, the clinical scores improved significantly. And the biggest kind of bonus and plus to this study uh, showing the biologic power is that the mean tendon thickness increased by two millimeters. You know, it may not sound like a lot, but in rotator cuff surgery, you know, that, that increased tendon thickness is kind of the holy grail of what we're trying to get to. And, you know, this, this data has kind of been troublesome to replicate, but the study showed 32 out of 33 patients had a non-progression of their tear, right? We went over the tear progression, so this may, this may be preventing it, uh, progression of the tear from partial thickness. So, but kind of um, what the use has become in surgery, and, you know, I, I've, I've done this, and, you know, uh, my partners have done this, and essentially you fix a full thickness tear, but in a person who may not have the best tendon quality or muscle quality, you lay this on top of the repair and this serves as your biologic augmentation. Whereas in the past, you may consider PRP as we just went over, something along those, the microfracture, something along those lines. Um, this is kind of, you know, usually covered in, in, in the uh, surgical sense from insurance purposes um, and you don't have to go, you know, kind of putting at risk the bone quality by doing microfracture, or you don't have to spin down someone's blood to, you know, harvest the blood kind of along those lines uh, and, and hope, you know, the water is out when you're injecting the PRP. Um, this is kind of, you see it, you, you tack it down with the bone staples um, and, and you, you know it's there and it's more biologic augmentation. Uh, so kind of interesting to see um, when that study comes out for the clinical outcomes uh, for full thickness tears that are repaired with this augmentation. Uh, we're kind of just using it now uh, based on our experience and, and our expertise in this area, uh, but we, we need longer, fo longer term follow up for sure. And then you get in, oh, sorry. Then you get into what we're kind of avoiding. We're trying to avoid. So all of these things we talk about, you know, fixing, maybe being a little bit more aggressive based on the recent literature, fixing smaller tears so they don't progress. Um, so you have lower revision rates, so you don't have higher infection rates, revision rates with injections, um, all these kind of things, getting out of pain earlier, but we're all trying to prevent the ir irreparable, irreparable rotator cuff. These are treatment dilemmas. Um, I have another paper in revisions right now in general shoulder elbow surgery, uh, kind of going through superior capsule reconstruction. Um, but anytime in orthopedics you see a long list or a list of multiple options, you know that there's no one straight answer. Right. Um, so there are multiple options and multiple kind of uh, things that we're trying to avoid because none of these are fantastic or 100 percent solutions. That's why we try as best as possible to avoid this irreparable rotator cuff state. And then irreparable rotator cuff leads to 
cuff tear arthropathy, meaning the arthropathy arthritis that comes with a rotator cuff tear, and then you would need a reverse replacement. Um, some rotator cuff tears are irreparable and massive to the point where you get a reverse anyway, uh, but that's at the bottom of the list. So at the beginning is tendon transfer is an option if they have relatively preserved motion, meaning greater than 90 degrees. There was a study that came out, clinical study, that these tendon transfers, lower trapezius uh, now is the preferred transfer for posterior superior, meaning supraspinatus or infraspinatus massive cuff tear. You do a lower trapezius tendon transfer, um, but the studies have shown that if you have less than 90 degrees, those clinically do not do well. Now, historically, that has, this has been a latissimus dorsi transfer, but has since been replaced with this lower trapezius transfer, which is more in line with the infraspinatus pull and is easier for your brain, right? Because you're turning a latissimus dorsi as an internal rotator, turning into an external rotator. It's hard for the brain to reprogram and kind of uh, readjust to, to, to perform that transfer. Um, so that's how the lower trapezius comes in. But again, everything comes with its own catch-22. If your motion is not preserved, the lower trapezius uh, has poor clinical outcomes. Then you get to patches, right? Patch augmentation, which we talked about partial cuffs and then full thickness tears that are repaired with augmentation. Um, so that's a possibility, but that only happens if you can get some tissue together. And even then it's debatable because that tissue is poor quality. So the augmentation, the patch, uh, the regenitin patch it's called, is, is not structural. So it has to hold, has to be good enough tissue to hold to allow the biologic to work. So if it's not good enough tissue and just rips apart, then the patch isn't gonna do anything. Next is the superior capsule reconstruction, as I kind of alluded to. In America, we use uh, human uh, acellular dermal allograft. Um, in, in the world and across the globe, uh, especially in Japan, they use fasciolata autograft, meaning taken from the patient's thigh. But in America, the higher morbidity, you know, trying to tell someone in America that you know, you're having shoulder surgery, but we're gonna take a graft from your thigh is almost, you know, it's foreign to them. So, um, it, you know, in America, we come up uh, with this allograft option and there's been many iterations of it. Um, like I said, my study is in revisions right now for uh, a, the next iteration, I hope. Uh, we showed biomechanically that with a thicker graft, you're able to restore the normal biomechanics of the glenohumeral joint therefore leading to less arthrosis, uh, less failures, et cetera, et cetera. And then kind of what we're trying to avoid because the reverse is a, is a great prosthesis, great procedure, I do many of them, uh, was trained you know, specifically in, in these types of uh, surgeries, but the reverse replacement, I, I can't guarantee to my patients you're gonna have normal range of motion with the reverse. So typically what I tell my patients with the reverse, you're gonna get you know, 140, 150, you're not gonna get 50 of external, you're gonna get maybe 30, you're not gonna get internal rotation up to L3, you're gonna internal rotation to probably to L5. Um, so in all those ways, we try and avoid getting to the point where they need a reverse. Hence all of the multiple options for your rural rotator cuff. So kind of taking everything in a spectrum, it kind of gives you more appreciation um, and, and kind of interest level in how to prevent getting to this point, right? And this, this is the kind of full circle thinking uh, that our patients sometimes are not able to see. They, they see they're in pain, they're in pain, they're in pain, or they got better, they got better, but not to the point where it's actually better to their, do their daily activities. And we just kind of have to nudge them one way or the other to try and avoid these types of situations. So I know I talk fast and, you know, oh, wanted to go through. So we, we believe in, you know, New England Shoulder Rubble, me and Dr. Ross and, and the whole, whole team that we have there, we have research assistants and army of medical students. We believe in research. We believe in research. That is the future. That is how we learn. That is how we get better. That's how we affect the most change in our field. Um, so right now, you know, the number is growing, but right now I have 15 in 2020 that are either accepted or in revisions or in press. So, you know, we're, we're moving towards this goal and, you know, we're trying to, going to keep moving forward. Oh yeah, and <laughs> this is just in there as a thank you. The fellows have recently voted me Teacher of the Year, so kind of thank you, and they're moving on. We just had a new group of fellows start as well, um, and thank you. So I'll open it up to kind of any questions. I know I talked fast. Um, that's just me, if you get to know me. Um, questions, concerns? Hey, Dr. Shah, it's Kyle Seisman from ATI Physical Therapy. How's it going? Good, good, Kyle. How are you? Good. I just, I think I heard you say that the patch augmentation is not structural. So if you had a massive cuff tear that was retracted quite a bit, 
you couldn't put that in there to make sure that it wasn't uh, you know, under too much tension? Um, so it's not structural at all. So there, there's been talk uh, and you know, I, there's a technique paper out, but there's no clinical study out from a guy in, in, in Detroit area in the Midwest. Um, he's doing what you're saying, but it, you can't use the patch augmentation. You have to use the um, acellular edema allograft or fascia lata autograft. And if you can't come over, then he kind of uses that to augment and pull that over. The biggest study, you know, I didn't want to get into the structural graphs, but the biggest study that came up was uh, Mahata did the original uh, superior capsule reconstruction study in 2012 in American Journal of Sports Medicine, where he compared structural graphs where you, you, you get the, just like you're saying, Kyle, you have the repair, you can't get it over, it's too much tension. So you add the graft to the existing tissue, then that kind of completes it and you repair it down to the tuberosity. He compared that to doing a superior capsule reconstruction, which is putting the graft instead of the rotator cuff, meaning attach it to the glenoid and then attach it to the tuberosity on the humerus. Um, that ended up being the better outcome for biomechanically, meaning uh, superior humeral head elevation and contact stresses on the acromion. These are what we measure to avoid cuff tear arthropathy. So doing just the augmentation structurally was not the best. The best was doing a full capsule reconstruction, meaning attaching to the glenoid and the tuberosity. So long-winded answer to your question, but this patch is not structural. This patch is purely biologic and meant to entice and bring your body's cells and, and growth factors into the area to help promote healing in a partial thickness. That's the FDA approval is partial thickness, but we're using it for full thickness that is that are repairable. So, you know, coming up, I have a 60 something year old guy, minimal arthritis. He kind of has good range of motion. It just has pain at night, difficult with daily activities, overhead stuff, um, but his tissue is not good quality. I think I can get a repair, but you can tell there's some fatty infiltration, but it's you know a negative tangent sign, so not at risk for poor outcomes or, or retail, all that kind of things. But just to you know give him a better chance of healing, because over 60 the blood flow starts to go down, and in fact over 65 is kind of the cutoff that we look at. You know, especially if you go by the you know go by the books, go by you know the ABOS boards. Um, 65 is kind of the cutoff for trying attempting a rotator cuff tear because the healing rates are are much like on a asymptotic level, much poorer um, because of the decreased blood flow. So I think uh, Randy has a question, sorry. Hey, um, so this is Randy Jean from uh, New England Baptist. Um, so my question was, are you and your colleagues using the single row microfracture in your techniques currently? Uh, we are, it depends on what the patient is. And again, you have to take into account bone quality. Um, so kind of, it's kind of a catch-22. You want to you want to use it in situations where you need it, right? You need the extra biologic, you need the extra healing. But at the same, and usually those those situations are revision cases. Um, but you know, similarly in revision cases, there's less real estate to work with. You know what I mean? Um, but so yeah, I mean, I haven't done it as much as maybe you know maybe I, I should be kind of implementing it. But you know, my colleagues at New England Baptist and 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 you know at, at New England Shore Nubo, you know, they're definitely implementing it, um, especially when you consider the improved techniques for microfracture. This was a kind of an old technique of microfracture itself using the awls. Now we have motorized micro drilling, meaning it's a smaller diameter and it goes to a deeper depth, which allows more recruitment of the marrow cells. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Shaw. This is uh, Xerxes over at ATI. Hi, hey, how's it going? Doing well, thanks. Thanks, for, first of all, for uh, setting up the talk. It's super fascinating yeah. stuff. I wanted to circle back to some of the stuff that you were speaking about to begin with as far as kind of the, the long-term effects of, of waiting, essentially, on getting a rotator cuff repair, going through the injection process. I think all, all the PTs have kind of seen in the past that patients have kind of gone through that particular process and at the end of the day inevitably end up going in for surgery anyway for the more complex tears. Um, I've been thinking a lot recently of a lot of the self-referred patients who are coming through our doors. They've been a little hesitant to go and attend anything clinically just because of this particular year. Um, and I'm kind of starting to wonder whether or not we should also be considering ep expediting some of these referrals back to specialists such as yourself. If we start to see these positive tests are kind of on 
this, this, you know, questionable nature of, you know, maybe it's not a full thickness potential, but there is definitely some sort of involvement, whether or not you feel that these are patients who need to be kind of seen for further follow-up or whether or not conservative care and working a little bit more on the course couples, um, as you suggested, is the way to go. Yeah, no, that's an excellent point, right? This, this data is kind of, uh, it, it's eye-opening, right? I mean, it, is. It, it really is good objective evidence to suggest that hey, the historical thinking, maybe, maybe we weren't doing it right all, all this time, right? So, you know, I circle back to this one because this is 10-year follow-up. So initial tear size, the smaller it is you start, the better integrity it is at 10 years, right? No, we're not doing this for two to five years. We want the best possible outcome for the longest period of time, right? That's just human nature. Um, so not only does it last kind of integrity-wise the longest, but it's smaller tears do better. So, you know, and then moving into the delayed repair part of it. Yeah. I mean, once you think about it, it kind of does make sense and it kind of goes along, correlates with the cartilage literature, which has now, you know, this rotator cuff literature is probably five to 10 years behind the cartilage, cartilage literature, which, you know, in cartilage, we've known for quite some time now that the more you delay doing any cartilage repairs and the older you get, it's all about the blood supply. It's all about the amount of growth factors that are present in your body to help facilitate a repair and an outcome that you prefer. Um, so to answer your question, I mean, I think you, you, it's hard to ignore this evidence. It's hard, it's hard to ignore it. And obviously I go through this with my patients. I explain to them point by point. Um, and you know, I can even, I'll show you the website online. I have some of this stuff online um, in the four patient section where the patient can go through and read for themselves at their own pace you know, go home and kind of take a look at it. Um, but it, in reality, yes, uh, this is kind of pointing us in that direction. And then you go to the study that I had even, you know, non-operative versus not operative, you end up doing better. You know, you can tell them you'll have a clinically significant increased probability of substantial improvement in the long term. So, you know, it's kind of hard to ignore this kind of evidence. Um, and, but you always want to make sure, you know, no one's bullying anybody, no one's pushing anybody. You, you let your patient make the informed decision. If they, they see this data and they still don't want it, that's their choice, it's their shoulder, you know what I mean? I'm just there to give them the full information, full disclosure, and the best advice that I, that I, that I can possibly give. And the only way I do that is by doing this research and by paying attention, reading, and staying up on what is current, what is going on. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, we'll see if anybody else has any more questions, but before I forget, I wanted to show the website. Um, so it's New England shoulder and elbow .com. Um, And when you get to here, you can see, you know, we have obviously go through the basic information, quick video for, for us and all this general information, but you can go down, click providers, appointments, all, you know, whatever. But research, you can see our current research fellows or ongoing research projects. What I want to show is this four patient section has some cool little videos to go through the, the video content sections over here. Um, but kind of I put up a blog of patient education information, you know, shoulder dislocation. This is what I was talking about for the shoulder injection may not be beneficial. Those two studies are in there. Overhead athlete stuff, shoulder arthritis. But in the road to the cuff injury, I kind of point the patients to this with cuff tears. They come in, you know, kind of go through what we just went through today, except in less detail, obviously. Um, what are the symptoms? How do you diagnose it? How is it treated? But then at the bottom, you know, treatments. Injury severity is critical consideration, tendon quality, multiple tendon size, full thickness. And then again, this is the key, pitfalls associated with non-operative management. So, you know, obviously less in depth than what we went through, but kind of quick blurbs that, you know, I even put one link if they want to go check out the article and, you know, see for themselves and read for their own kind of peace of mind. And, once patients see it, they kind of get the idea um, and that, you know, kind of pushes them in their own way to, to make the same kind of decisions. So, yeah. Anybody else have any questions? Feel free, reach out. So this was, you know, this is the second installment. If you guys missed it, the first one was reverse, um, reverse shoulder arthroplasty. That PDF is up on the website. I'll put this video up on the website and the PDF as well. Um, but this is an open conversation. If you guys have any questions about patients, about 
uh, rotate the cutoff, reverse, whatever it is, you know, that email address that was sent to you for the Zoom link is my personal e uh, business email, um, but I check it once a day. If you know, feel free, open dialogue. Uh, any thoughts, concerns, questions, feel free to send them my way. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Doc. Thank you, Dr. Shaw.